I don't know if I'm going to write a book on this or not. Jill says I have to, uh, but I'm really focused on, in my own personal life right now, this, this idea of living a Jesus-focused life. What does that look like? I feel like sometimes in my Christian life, I'm always trying to attain something. I'm always trying to attain something. For me, sometimes Christianity, for me personally, feels like here I am, there's the target, and I never get there, and I never get there. And I don't know if that's just me. I don't know if you all feel that way. But as I began to think about that, and as I began to read through the scriptures, I began to realize that I don't think that that's the life that Jesus has in plan for me. He says stuff like this. It's in the presence of the Lord that there's fullness of joy. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Experiencing the presence of Jesus in your life, in your marriage, in your home, it, it brings a presence of joy. It brings things that change everything in our life. And so I began to realize that the Christian life is not just about where you're headed, but it's also about being able to stop and enjoy where you are right now with the Lord in your life. We can't, always, we can't always be pushing, 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 or regretting, regretting, regretting. Sometimes we have to stop and just be able to bask and rest and be refreshed in what the Lord Jesus is doing in our life right now today, because in his presence is fullness of joy, living a Jesus-focused life. And I began to think about that in my interactions with people that are all around me. Because as I've gotten older, I don't know what God's doing. He's changing my heart. He's changing my life. I think when I was a younger man, I'm just running here and there. And I know Jacob just brought up some reality about me that while I greeted him, he happened to get sprayed with juice all over his body. We have a phrase around the church here. Uh, Timothy broke that. Uh, he broke that. Uh, pastor broke that. If something's broke, good chance I broke it, right? But all that to be said... All that to be said is I'm thinking about, you know, slowing down, stopping, and I'm thinking about Jesus, how Jesus didn't just pass by people. He was aware of people around them. He was aware of who they are, and he was aware of trying to just bless them, to help them anywhere he went. So I've been trying to live that way. I've been trying to think that way. And so I've had some failures. The other day I was at Walmart and there was a man in front of me and he was buying a belt. And he said to the teller across the, 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 the aisle, he, she, he said, yeah, I've got to buy a new belt. I've just unexpectedly lost about 40 pounds. Cancer. That's what he said, cancer. And she looked at him and I was kind of getting my stuff and I kind of overheard. And then he grabbed his stuff and he, and he took off. And I jumped in my car and I'm driving off and I'm like, I missed it. I missed it. What would it have been like for me to stop and just say, you got cancer? Hey, do you believe in prayer? Do you believe in prayer? Yeah, I do. Or maybe he says, I don't. Maybe he says, I don't. I say, well, can I pray for you anyway? Or if he says, yeah, I do believe in prayer. Why couldn't I at that moment just put my hand on his back and say, can I pray for you right now? Hallelujah. I mean, I, I missed that moment. So I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to focus on how the Lord wants to work in me and through me, right? We've been talking about that for the last several months, that Jesus wants to work in me, but he also wants to work through me, right? Now, uh, as we mature, we get more focused on the through me, but as we're still growing and struggling, we get focused on the in me stuff, right? What are you doing in me? What are you doing for me? What are you doing to me? But as we mature, we begin to focus and, and, and look at how God wants to work, not just in me, but he wants to work through me. So yesterday, Jill and I are at Walmart. We're standing in line. And, you know, we, you know, with Jill and I, we're always trying to, you know, find out where's the closest parking spot? Where's the fastest line to get your stuff checked out? She's in this line. I'm like, Jill, I kind of suggest nicely that this line might be a little bit shorter, you know? So we jump over in this line and we're standing there and the people in front of us, and obviously immediately we get there, we know that we got serious problems. This lady has got all the money out in her hand and she's counting and she's recounting. She's got two older guys by her. They're taking stuff off the cart. They're putting it back on the cart. I mean, they're, they're like subtracting. They're taking away. And I could see we're having a big problem here and I just stopped. And I realized these people need help. So I stepped up and I said, hey, are you guys taking stuff off the cart? Like, are you doing that? And he said, yeah, she counted wrong. We got less money than what we thought. I said, don't worry about it. I'm paying for everything. 
And you would not believe the smile that shot on these people's face. And then you would not believe the people across the counter who were doing the checkouts. You would not believe how they all of a sudden, everything changed. They started laughing. They start scanning stuff. They start putting it in there. She's smiling at me. It's like the whole thing changed. And then I pull out my card and on my, my card, it says, Pastor Timothy Cowan, Pastor of the Rock Church. But on the flip side, it says, experience God. And I didn't really remember that. I hand this to the guy. The guy took the car, looked at it. He says, loud enough for everybody to hear standing in the area. I've experienced God right now. I've experienced God right now. And I'm like, amen, that's God that did that. I just want you to know that's the Rock Church. The Rock Church has helped pay for you right there. The Rock Church took care of your groceries today. I'm coming to, I don't know if he's going to come or not. I'm not going to embarrass him. I'm not going to point him out to everybody, okay? I pray that he comes and God moves in his life. God wants to work in us, but he also wants to work through us. And that's living, learning how to live this Jesus-focused life, where I begin to, begin to walk in what God's doing in this world. And when you begin to walk in that place, everything elevates. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching, uh, and you think, I need to experience God. I want to experience a Jesus-focused life. Maybe you need what we call revival. Maybe you need renewal. Maybe you need to be recharged. You know, we have to fill up our vehicles with gas, right? We have to fill up our bodies with nutrition. When I was in the army, we had to do preventative maintenance. We had to do preventative maintenance on the helicopter. It was scheduled. It had to be done. Well, I want you to also know that we also have to have spiritual preventive maintenance in our life from time to time. There are times that my life needs to be filled up. There are times that my, my life needs spiritual fuel. There are times when I need soul nutrition. There's, there are times when I need some preventative maintenance in my life to, to, to enable me to prevent me from destroying things in my life. And so here's what happens with revival. Revival is when something that was dead comes back to life again. And maybe there's a dead spirituality in your life. It's dull and it needs to come back to life again. You remember a time when you were on fire for Jesus. You were filled with Jesus and you experienced his presence and that's dead. I want you to know today is the day for it to become alive and on fire again today. Amen? Renewal. Sometimes we need renewal. Something that's gotten old, something that's gotten stale, something that's gotten decayed. It needs to become fresh. It becomes new. Jesus brings newness in our life. I'm thankful for that. Maybe you're here today and you need reformation. Something in your life that is wrong or it's warped or it's worldly. It needs to be changed. The Lord can change it. Maybe you need regeneration. Regeneration is when you begin to live again the way that God intended for your life to be. How many of you know that life is supposed to be a blessing, not a burden? That's God's plan. And when you begin to walk according to the ways of the Lord, and you let him work in you and through you, your life begins to transform into a blessing for yourself and to others around you, rather than being a burden to yourself and you being a burden to others around you. That can all stop today, right now. If anybody believes that, say amen. amen. I love the first. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Acts 3.20. When Peter stands up and preaches the sermon, just like I'm preaching right now, he calls out to the Lord, this Jesus who was the Son of God, you crucified him. You literally killed the Son of God. And now God raised him from the dead. And he is now alive. And there is no salvation. There is no life. There is no future. There is no joy. There is no power. There is no healing unless it comes from one name. And that name is Jesus. You can't get that anywhere else. And all the people are struck to their heart. What do we do? What do we do? Well, here's the answer. Repent. Boy, that's the answer we don't like today. Can I find another preacher? Can I find another book to buy? That's not the, that's not the message that I want to hear. Repent. Doesn't God just let me be whoever I want to be? No, if he did, then he wouldn't be God, would he, right? He's God. He's the Lord. He doesn't take advice from you. You take advice from him. 
He doesn't take leadership from you. You take leadership from him, right? He's the Lord. He's God. And so what do we do? What do we do? Here's what Peter says. Repent. Repent. Start changing. Start, start changing your mind. Start changing your actions. Start changing your life. And then I love what he says in Acts chapter 3, verse 20. Listen to it. And times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. If you're in here today, how many of you need a time of refreshing in your life? How many of you need a time of refreshing in your marriage? How many of you need a time of refreshing in your relationship to your children or to your grandchildren? How, how many of you need a time of refreshing in your workplace, in your life, physically, nutritionally? Folks, this year we have had people who have been told, you have to have your liver replaced, and God said, nope, you don't. We've had people in this place that doctors have said, you have to have cancer removed, and God said, nope, I'm going to remove that for you. You think I'm joking and lying? I'm not joking and lying. How many can say amen? They saw that happen in this church. Amen? Just this year, our God is not dead. He is alive. And he's just alive in your life as you want him to be. You want your marriage to be healed? Give it to him. Release it to him. Take your hands off of it. Say, Lord Jesus, this is it. I'm laying before you. You have your way. You do what you want to do. Change it. Fill me. If I got to repent, I'll repent. If I got to change, I got to change. I'm going to do whatever I can in order to experience your best, Lord Jesus, in my life. If that means I have to repent, then I will repent. But some people will say, if that means I have to repent, then I'm not going to repent. Some people consciously make that decision, don't they? And they just descend and descend and they descend and they descend. Until they finally get to the place that they realize the Lord God Almighty is a better driver of my life than I am myself. Amen? Times are refreshing coming from the Lord. Well, there are keys. There are principles to experience God and revival and renewal and regeneration and fresh start. And Jesus taught us all about these things. So I'm just going to share with you a couple of very brief things that I hope that are going to be reminders to you because you should already know these principles, but some of you may be fresh, it may be new. I pray that you'll build your life around these and you will never regret it. And here they are. Let's look. Number one, focus on the right things. If you change your focus, you will change your life. If you aim at the right target, you'll change your life. So what is the focus of your life right now? And if it is not Jesus, you need to repent. It can't be, I'm going to focus on being rich and then Jesus. I'm going to focus on my job and then Jesus. I'm going to focus on my children and then I'm going to add Jesus on. Jesus is not salt and pepper. He is not a condiment. He is not an add-on in your life. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he wants to be the King of your life. And I know sometimes we resist that because we don't like people to tell us what to do. We don't like to follow other people's directions. In our hearts, we are all rebels, every single one of us. We have all sinned, every single one of us. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, every single last one of us. So every person in this room, no matter what you think of yourselves, you are a lawbreaker, you are independent, you have made decisions that are are, that are ulterior to what God's will is. And so every single person in this room, at some essence in our life, we have to live a life of repentance, meaning refocusing, making sure that things are in the right order in our life. And so the very first thing, if I'm going to experience this, this time of refreshing from the Lord in my life, I've got to begin to make sure that my life is focused on the right things. Aim at the right target and you'll hit the right bullseye. So what is my focus? I have to identify my focus, whether I like it or not. We have to be real about this. I'm going to encourage you guys to do this. Don't, don't let this just go in one ear and out the other. Let me ask you right now, what is your life focus right now? You have to, very first thing, you have to identify what's my focus right now. There are some people in this room, your focus right now is what you're going to eat for lunch, and then what you're going to eat for dinner, and then what you're going to eat for breakfast tomorrow morning. You think I'm joking, I'm not. There are some people that get obsessed and their focus is on food, especially in America. You all know that to be true, right? 
Some people, their focus is just making money. I've got an uncle. I love him. He was a Christian man, but his focus was making money. If I went to his house from the beginning of the morning till at night, he had the stock market on all day long. I've never been in somebody's house that's like that. Maybe your house is like that. I don't know. But I mean, all day long, you just go across. You just be watching his stock market, what it's doing, minute by minute, hour by hour, it's just breezing by. That was kind of his focus in his life. Sometimes people focus on their failures. Have you met people like that? They cannot move forward. They spend their entire life focusing on their failures. You start talking to them, and eventually you're going to find out what somebody did to them, what's happened to them, what, 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 what their past was like, how unjust everything is, how terrible everything is. Some people, they're fixated. They have a focus on the past. Some people are so focused on the future, they can't even make sure that they do the simple things that they need to do to have balance in their life today. You all know what I'm talking about, right? I don't have to go on and on and on. People focus on so many different things. In fact, yesterday, I saw a guy, he was interviewed, he said his focus is to be the greatest hot dog eater in the history of the world. I hope he gets it. I don't know if I hope he gets it or not. But people have crazy focuses, right? But key to life is focus. And in Matthew chapter 6, I want you to see this verse. Here's what Jesus said about focus. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye what? We have to say that first. Well, I'm seeking the kingdom. Are you first? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And what is he talking about in this passage? You all know this passage. He starts talking, and in, 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 this is a sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's Jesus' sermon. It's as if, you know, if Jesus was standing here and preaching a sermon, this is what he did. But he did it on a mountainside, and it got recorded. And we call it the Sermon on the Mount. And he's preaching a sermon. He's talking about real practical things in people's lives. And, and he's standing in front of who knows how many people. It's a big throng, crowd of people. And he began to talk to them 2,000 years ago about the exact same things that worry you and me in this room today. Your life, your health, the hairs on your head, the clothes that you're going to wear, the food that you're going to eat, you know, the things that you got to pay for, all these things. It's like the Gentiles, people who don't have an understanding of a God, people who don't know that there's a God, they all worry about these things. They focus on these things. Their focus is on these things. But this is what he says. I am reminding you, you have a father in heaven. You have a father in heaven. He knows all your needs. So don't focus on the stuff of the world. Focus on the one who created the world. Give him glory. And your Father who is in heaven that provided all that you see, he will provide for you. Does anybody in here believe that? In 1988, I, I think this is funny. I was reading this today. In 1988, Bobby McFerrin, he's a jazz singer. He's a songwriter. And he hit it big with a little bitty song called, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Do you all remember that? And in 1988, it hit number one, the first song. He came out of obscurity into immediate worldwide fame. Later on, the song of the year, it was awarded as in 1988. McFerrin also won the best pop male performer of the year. And the song has a mixed legacy, really. One music critic said it was a formula for facing life's trials. Don't worry, be happy. It's a formula for facing life's trials. Don't worry, be happy. Uh, another critic said, as long as the English language is spoken and sung, this song is going to be around. Do you all think that's so? Some of you are singing it right now, and you're like, I'm going to be singing it for the whole week, Pastor. But at the same time, as you can imagine, some people hated it. <laughs> uh, do you know there's always haters, there are always doubters, always, I call them balloon poppers. You got your balloon, you're ready for the party, and somebody comes along, pop, <laughs> pop. There's negative complainers about this song. One person said it's among the 50th worst songs of all time. 
One guy said the song needs to be banned from the radio. One person said, it's difficult to think of a song more likely to plunge you into suicidal despondency than this. I'm like, is he listening to the same song? If somebody comes up to me and says, don't worry, be happy, it's going to spring me into suicidal despondency on the moment, right? He lambasted that it had appalling lyrics. The truth is that, and if this hurts you, I'm praying that it'll hurt you so it can heal you. The truth is that there are some people that like to be unhappy. They like to focus on the negative. They like to focus on the things that bring worry, the the, the, the devil things, right? And we've been talking about this all year long in this world that we live in. Do we want to sit in here and talk about what the devil's doing? Or do we want to sit in here and thank God for what God's doing? Because God is not alive and he's still working in this world. Amen? Amen. And so here's what the Lord Jesus says. Your life focus, what you should be dedicated to, what you should be fixated on, what you should be pursuing You have life. What is your life focused on? Here it is. Focus on the kingdom of God. And when you do that, all these things will be added unto you. I love that. What you eat, what you drink, your clothing, your daily needs. The world worries, but we're released from worry because we know that we have a father that provides these things. Amen? I don't know if you come across this song recently, but I did just two weeks ago. Jill and I came across a song written by Landon Wolf. It was featured at Passion once a year. Thousands and thousands of people show up in Atlanta at the Passion Conference to worship the Lord and to lift up the Lord and exalt the Lord. And this song was featured there. In fact, write it down. It will bless your heart this afternoon. If you have not heard this song, write it down. Look at it on YouTube. It's called, it's, it's simply called The Lord Will Provide Landon Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. And here's what the song talks about. He sings in a song and he says, my God is not empty handed. He keeps his promises. Everything I need, everything I need, my father has it. My father has it. So why should I worry at all? When he sings that phrase right there, so why should I worry at all? It's a rhetorical question with a big answer. If my God is the Lord Jesus Christ, the answer is no, I don't have to worry. He holds my hands in his life. Maybe you're here today and you have worries, anxieties, life hiccups, ditches. Maybe you need revival and renewal and reformation, regeneration. You're hungry. You need change. You need something new. Aim at the right target. Refocus. Jesus would simply say today, this morning, he would say, repent. The very first gospel that was ever written was the book of Mark. And in the very first chapter of the book of Mark, we have the very first words recorded of Jesus' ministry. And I want you to see them here. It says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And he was saying, listen, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the very first things that came out of Jesus' mouth. Repent. Jesus is teaching us to reorder, to change. The word repent literally means metanoia. It's talking about your mind. Have a change of mind. Come to a place today, right now, you have been confronted with the kingdom of God Now, as you're confronted with the kingdom of God and the king, your response is to change, to transition, to let there be a change of mind and a change of heart. I am now going to follow the king and live in his kingdom. I'm going to bow down. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to release. I'm going to give all these things to him. 
And here is the foundation of a blessed life, a rewarded life. Everything else flows from this. I put God first in my life. I put God first in my life. When it comes to my day, I, I make sure that I spend time first with God in the morning. I put God first in my life. When it comes to my money, I make sure I give to God first my offering, my love offering, my offering of thanksgiving. When, I, when I'm thinking about my money, the first thing I do is I put God first in my money. I give him that offering. I worship him. I give God first in my marriage and in my family. I'm making sure that everybody in my home knows that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to make mistakes because I'm a sinner just like all other men that have ever lived. But I just want people to know my focus, my direction, my aim is that I am seeking God and his righteousness because I know that if I do that, the Lord's going to take care of my wife. He's going to take care of my children. He's going to take care of my grandchildren. There are times where I know that I am not have the ability to care for my family like I want to, like I desire to. But guess what? I know I have a heavenly father and he's going to provide. Amen. So maybe you're here today and you need to repent. But let me just, let me just bring this up. Can you repent for other people? Can you repent for other people? Because in a sense, I believe that we as God's people, we need to be repenting, not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors and for our nation and for the people that are around us. Can I repent for others? And I'm going to say, sure. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. Now, they are the only ones that can make a change in their life, but you can pray prayers of repentance. You can pray prayers of intercession for other people that can bring power into their lives, into the situations of their lives. Let me give you an example. Daniel. Daniel, when he was thinking about his people, he's thinking about their sin, he was thinking about them. Daniel's probably one of the most righteous men that you and I will ever know or ever read about. He got up in the morning, he prayed. In the afternoon, he prayed. In the evening, he prayed. When they made it a national law that you can't pray, he walked right out there, put his life on the line. They literally threw his body into a den where he was supposed to be executed by being eaten by lions, and God saved him from that, right? This, this, this is a righteous, righteous, righteous guy. In my own personal opinion, I know if I was talking to Daniel and he was here right now, Daniel would look at you and he would say, yeah, I've got things in my life to, that I've got to repent of. But for me, as an observer of history and of the word of God and knowing he's a prophet, I would think Daniel, he probably doesn't have a whole lot to repent of. He's already done that, right? So why is he repenting? Well, let me show you why the righteous man is repenting. Daniel chapter 9, verse 4 and 6, he sees the state of his nation, he's burdened by it. I see the state of my husband, I'm burdened by it. I see the state of my wife, I'm burdened by it. I see the state of my child, I'm burdened by it. I see the state of my city, St. Louis. I see the darkness here, I see the murder that's here, I see the, the addiction that's here. I'm burdened by it. What do I do? Well, I can pray like Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 4 through 6, listen to what he says. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, we have sinned. You see that? We have sinned. We have been wicked. We have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to you. He's saying we, 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 we. He's identifying with their sin. And then I want you to see what he says. This is Daniel 9, verses 17 through 19. We do not make request of you because we are righteous. Do you see what Daniel's saying? We're not calling out to you, God, because we deserve it. I'm not calling out to you, Lord, because I'm righteous. I'm not calling out to you because I'm holy. I'm not calling out to you, oh Lord, saying, would you please bless me and give me favor to reward me because I've been such a good, faithful follower of you. He's not saying that. He's saying, Lord, we have blown it. We have messed up. I'm not coming to you because I'm righteous. I'm not coming to you because I deserve it. But look what he says very next. But because... Of your great mercy, Lord. Because of your great mercy, Lord. Listen, listen. 
Now I want you to see this definition of intercessory prayer. Would you bring it up on the very next screen? Intercessory prayer is leaning in on the mercy of God. Lord, I'm calling to you. Oh God, I'm leaning on your mercy for my son. Would you rescue him? I'm calling on you, oh God, I'm leaning on your mercy for my child's marriage. I'm calling on your mercy, God, for my cousin who's addicted to drugs. And I'm asking you, Lord, deliver them, save them, have your hand upon them. Do you see as we focus on the Lord, as we call out to God, as we repent and change, the Lord meets us in those places and he begins to change everything. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's have our worship team come. First, our focus. Identify today, folks. What are you focused on? Can you think of it right now? On a piece of paper. You should be able to write something and be honest about it. Okay, what's the focus of my life right now? Bam, health. You know, it's, it's, it's money. It's my children. I'm raising them. I don't know what it is. I know people, the focus of their life is drugs and pleasure. I mean, we go on and on and on and on and on. But the answer on that question should be, what is the focus of my life? In Jesus. But deep in our heart, when we know that that answer is incongruent with the reality of our lives, we have to say, Lord, I know you're not first when it comes to the health of my life. Lord, I know you're not first when it comes to my business. Lord, you're first when I'm sitting at church on Sundays. Lord, I know that you haven't been first when it comes to my goals, my vision, my plans for my children. Lord, I know you haven't been first when it comes to go on and on and on and on. What's the answer for healing? Repent. Let Jesus touch that and heal it. Let Jesus, let Jesus do something today that only he can do. Just a minute, Jill and I will be here to pray for you. And I'm going to have our elders that are here to come forward to pray for you. We have oil on the front row and the oil, it represents God's spirit. The Bible says if anybody needs to be healed, if anybody needs a breakthrough, if anybody needs the touch of God, anoint them with oil and let people pray for them. I'll tell you what, we believe in healing in this place, not just because we believe it, but also because we've seen it. We've seen it. We know that God is powerful. And so I encourage you, maybe you're moved to plead for the mercy of God for our country. Would you do that right now? We're only a week away from 4th of July. We've got a humongous election coming up in the fall. We've got a table on the foyer week by week. We're going to be adding stuff, taking stuff, giving stuff. Just try to help us to be an educated Christian citizens. So I encourage you to go by the foyer. We've got some wonderful people in our church that are helping us to help us to have, have knowledge. But what about right now today, right, right in this place? Don't leave here. If you need God to touch something in your life, to fix something in your life, don't leave here without letting the Lord bring healing and power. Let's stand together. Lord Jesus, I love you and I praise you and I give you all the glory. And Lord Jesus, you are the one that said, seek ye first your Father's kingdom and your Father's righteousness and your Father's ways. And Lord, everything else will be taken care of. It's so simple, Lord, but we make it so complex and hard and difficult. It's like a war every day to ensure that you are king in every way. Jesus, be lifted up. Lord, I pray and thank you for the healings we have seen, Lord, over the last weeks and months. Thank you for the lives that we have seen changed. Thank you for the people that we have seen baptized. Thank you, Lord, for the healings that we have rejoiced with Lord. Thank you for the comfort that you've given as people have been walking through the valley of the shadow of death in their lives, Lord. And even at times, Lord, when things have been dismal, you have been faithful, Lord. We thank you for that. Jesus, I'm asking you right now in these moments, do something unusual. Lord, we're asking for you. Lord, move right now. 
Let us see your signs and wonders. Do what only you can do, Lord, in the invisible places in people's hearts right now in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like this.